And welcome to our lunch study break. It is Wednesday, December 16th, and today is the sixth day of Hanukkah. Uh, and I thought it might be fun to dig a little bit into the story of Hanukkah. I think this year, perhaps more than other years, maybe for obvious reasons or because of the pandemic, uh, people are really getting into Hanukkah. Uh, and our, our, the numbers for our candle lightings have been pretty high and pretty great. And musicians from Broadway stars to Nirvana members um, are recording Hanukkah music. I said, you know, I said once members of Nirvana are recording Hanukkah music, we probably jumped the shark um, as a society, I think. Uh, and uh, um, so I think, you know, what's been interesting is the real, I mean, it's always been popular, especially when juxtaposed to Christmas. So uh, what I wanted to do is dig a little bit into the narrative, especially vis-a-vis -vis some of the conversations that we have been having here over the past few months with regard to the role of Jews in a political environment. What should be our role? Um, should we rebel? Should we stay quiet? Should we accommodate? Uh, a lot of these issues come up in the story of Hanukkah. So uh, what I'm going to do is, all right, first word of warning, I am not a historian. So I just want to state that at the outset, I am a rabbi. I view these texts through a rabbinic lens unapologetically. Uh, I am an apologist. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, and what I'll try to do is sum up a little bit of the narrative. Uh, as I think you know, or as we've discussed, the story of Hanukkah does not appear in the Tanakh. It appears in two historical sources, in Josephus and in the book of Maccabees, which is included in the Christian Bible. And I just thought I would begin with setting the stage of what Hanukkah is historically. So let me open it up. Maybe I'll even start with the end of the story. I'll start with the end of the story, which is the rabbis of the Talmud. If it was 175 BCE was the story of Hanukkah. So the rabbis are writing this 400 years later, 500 years later, and they address, and they are Lily, if you could just let people in, that would be great. And they are addressing the question um, of, you know, obviously this is a practice that has gone on for years. And the rabbis taught this is the way that it's done. And as Marilyn Heiss shared beautifully last night in her teaching, there's the Beit Shammai way of lighting the candles. There's the Beit Hillel way of lighting the candles. There's a third perhaps way of lighting the candles. Okay, so this is done, and the rabbis have their usual conversation about how it's supposed to be done. All right, that's the first part. Then the second question, which is going to be the heart of my question here, is, well, what my Hanukkah? What, what in the world is Hanukkah? What is it? Why are we celebrating it? And the rabbis taught, on the 25th of Kislev, begin the days of Hanukkah, which are eight, during which lamentation for the dead and fasting are forbidden. For when the Greeks entered the temple, they defiled all the oils in it. And when the Hasmonean dynasty prevailed against them and defeated them, they, the Hasmoneans, searched and found only one cruise of oil, which possessed the seal of the high priest, but which contained sufficient oil for only one day's lighting. Yet a miracle occurred there, and they lit the lamp for eight days. The following year, these days were appointed a festival and the recitation of Hallel and thanksgiving okay so the rabbis very i mean barely go into the story of the hasmoneans and the greeks real perfunctory history lesson here and they have this story of this cruise of oil which only appears here so we can read into that what it is but when they asked what is the essence of hanukkah they focus in on the light and the light and the miracle of the light, a miracle heretofore unexpressed in any of our sources. Okay, so that's that's the takeaway. And for the most part, that's how people understand the holiday. We eat latkes, which are very oily, and sufganiyot, which are very oily. We don't lament for the dead. We don't lament, we don't fast. So if you're doing IF, 
Anybody out there who's doing IF can't do IF over Hanukkah. I'm sorry, not permitted. That's intermittent fasting. Not allowed to do it over Hanukkah. You can't fast for 24 hours because you have to celebrate. You have to rejoice and you have to eat a lot of jelly donuts. All right, and that's, and we wanna light up the dark times. I would say for the most part, that's the understanding of Hanukkah. Now let's take a look into the historical document, the first book of Maccabees. This is broken up a little bit. Again, I'm not a historian. I just wanna express the story as best understood in the historical documents. And along the way, I will try to make allusions to our current war. That's right, none of that is in the book of Maccabees, as Gary points out, that's exactly correct. This is novel and new, the story of the oil. So now let's go to the book of Maccabees. Can you see that? Do people see the book of Maccabees on their screen? Okay, good. After Alexander, so now we, we have Alexander the Great, right? Alexander come, he conquers the whole world. All right, so just this is placing us in the context here. The Macedonian who came from the land of Kitin had defeated Darius, king of the Persians and the Midis, and they succeeded him as king. He had previously become king of Greece. He fought many battles, conquered strongholds, and put to death the kings of the earth. He advanced to the ends of the earth, plundered many nations. When the earth became quiet before him, he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. He gathered a very strong army and ruled over countries, nations, and princes, and they became tributary to him. After this, he fell sick and perceived that he was dying. So he summoned his most honored officers who had been brought up with him from use and divided his kingdom while he was still alive. After Alexander had reigned for 12 years, he died and then his officers began to rule each in his own place. They all put crowns after his death and so did their sons. Okay, so this kingdom is being divided up after the death of Alexander the Great. Uh, and from this came forth, according to the book of Maccabees, a sinful root, Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, son of Antiochus the king. He had been a hostage in Rome. He's actually the youngest son, interestingly, of Antiochus, the king, was Epiphanes. I think there might be something to him being the youngest of the, the litter there. Uh, he ends up as the ruler. He began to reign in 137th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. In those days, lawless men came forth from Israel and misled many, saying, let us go and make the covenant with the Gentiles round about us. For since we separated from them, many evils have come upon us. This proposal pleased them. And some of the people eagerly went to the king. So they said, you know, it really isn't been good for the Jews living under this Antiochus Epiphanes dude. He doesn't like the way we do it. So let's, uh, let's get in favor with the king. And um, so some of the people eagerly went to the king and he authorized them to, well, what did he say? He said, stop being Jews, be more like the Gentiles. And so what did they do? Well, they worked on their fitness because when I think of what do Gentiles do more than Jews, they built a gymnasium. I'm kidding here. I'm just, I'm, excuse a little humor. They built the gymnasium in Jerusalem, according to the Gentile custom. They removed the marks of the circumcision and abandoned the Holy Covenant. They joined with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. Uh, when Antiochus saw that his kingdom was established, he decided to attack Egypt and he went off and he attacked Ptolemy, king of Egypt, in battle. After returning from Egypt, he comes back in the year 143. He went up against, of the Greek world, he went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. And there, I don't, there's something about what happened in his absence during the time that he's in Egypt fighting the war, but he returns very upset. And he enters the sanctuary and the golden altar and the lampstand for the lights and all the utensils. He takes the table for the bread of preference, presence, the cups for drink offerings, the bowls, the golden censers, the curtain, the crowns, the gold decoration in front of him. He takes it all for himself. He took the silver and the gold and the costly vessels, and he took also the hidden treasures which he found. Then the king wrote to the whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should give up their customs. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many, even from Israel, gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols. They profaned the Sabbath. 
the king sent letters to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah. He directed them to follow the strange customs in the land to forbid the burnt offerings. Basically said, you know, you guys can't go into your synagogues any longer, sacrifice and drink offerings in the synagogues to profane, order them to profane the Sabbath and feasts to defile the sanctuary. So he's just trolling the Jews here and just making a mockery of what they deem to be holy, to build altars. And basically, you know, he's saying we are the smart, sophisticated Greek culture. You guys are anachronistic. You guys are slaughtering animals. We're the people of Plato and Aristotle. Get over your antiquated, pagan, cultish ways. Um, and, you know, sacrifice swine and unclean animals and don't do this barbaric circumcision of your sons, which is clearly uh, prehistoric. So uh, a whole bunch of people thought that this was a great idea. Uh, and um, they were to make them, and so they really went along to get along with the Greeks. Um, and so um, in these days, Matityahu or Mattathias was the son of John, the son of Simeon, the, he was a priest. It's important to understand that he comes from the priesthood. So the defiling of the priestly artifacts in the temple would hit him harder than most. So he has five sons. One is called Judas, called Maccabeus. And he saw all the blasphemies being committed in Judah and Jerusalem. Then the king's officers who were enforcing the apostasy. So then they weren't sufficient. The king wasn't sufficient with just destroying the worshiping that was happening in the temple, they also came to the city of Modin and demanded that the people living there also make these unclean sacrifices. And many came from Israel with them and Matityahu and his sons were assembled and the king's officers, they said to him, you know, come on, Matityahu, you're a reasonable leader. You're honored and great in this city. You're supported by your sons and brothers. Get everyone to come in here and take the vaccine. And you should just tell them that they that they, they don't have the right to refrain from this, that their old barbaric prehistoric ways need to go by the wayside, that they need to get with society because we've got situations going on here. So why don't you, Matityahu, be the first to come forward, get your shot, do what the king demands, and all of the Gentiles and the men of the Judah, you know, they'll they'll follow your lead. Matityahu answered and said in a loud voice, even if all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him and have chosen to do his commandments, departing each one from the religion, even if every other Jew, every other nation on the planet, everybody gives in to this dreadful ordinance. I and my sons and brothers, no matter how anachronistic we might look, we're going to keep with the covenant of our fathers. Far be it for us to desert the law and the ordinances. We will not obey the king's words by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. When he had finished speaking, another Jew came forward who disagreed with Matitya, who was worried about the people surviving and offered the sacrifice to appease the king. When Matitya, who saw this, he burned with zeal and his heart was stirred. He gave vent to righteous anger and he ran and he killed him up on the altar. At the same time, he killed the king's officer who was forcing them to sacrifice and he tore down the altar. Thus he was burned with zeal for the Lord, just like Pinchas, that story in the Bible. And then Matisyahu cried out in the city saying, they may take our land, but they may not take our freedom. He takes a band of brigands and says, let everyone who is zealous for the Lord come and support me out in the woods and let's create a little guerrilla army and hide out in the hills until the time comes for us to attack. All right, so that's the beginning part of the story of uh, Hanukkah. Um, and I wanted to do, for, I wanna amplify it a little bit, but I wanna just pause and see if there are any questions just on that beginning part of the story, just on the setup. All right, any, any questions about that? How does it correspond with what Josephus wrote about the rebellion? Um, again, I'm no historian. Um, and what I've sort of compiled is just the summation of the best historical sources. I have another source that I'm about to cite here that goes a little bit into, this comes from Rabbi Hirsch, 
I'm assuming the story of Jason, which I'm going to talk a little bit about here, who name is Joshua. Apparently he's well off, he's a well off Jew. And what does a well off Jew do in a corrupt society? Well, he buys his way to become a high priest naturally. Uh, and I believe that those come from Josephus. And so we're gonna go into that. So it might have a little bit more of the story here, but I'm not 100% positive on that. Sandy Edwards. I heard this wonderful lecture from Rabbi Yitz Greenberg this morning. Mm. On, I saw that. I missed that. Tell us what he said. Well, if you read, he's also doing a weekly Devar Torah, you know, online through Hadar. And if you read that, you can see what he's saying. But I'm going to quote he had both a history of historical events that happened. And then he also uh, has his source sheet. But um, the upshot, and I'm sure you're going to get there, is that what makes sense in the end is that um, life, life is, takes precedence over Shabbat and over all the rituals, and that acculturation is okay as long as you have the opportunity to preserve Judaism because if if um the so sacrificing pigs on the altar is that acculturation did he address no, that that is not acculturation but it's also not doesn't make sense to be martyrs and to be all killed because he says you know as you go through the story there are Hasidim which are different than the Hasidim now That's right. but they were these total fanatics who would become martyred rather than bend I mean, I, I'm looking, I mean, doesn't Matsityahu uh, strike you as a little bit of a fanatic here uh, in the story that we just read? But he ends up fighting back. Um, you know, I can't speak for Yitz Greenberg, but I will post uh, his source sheet. And Please do. Please do. Absolutely. And maybe we can add it. I've, I've brought several source sheets with me. I'm trying to narrow down the amount of text that I put out there so we can get what I think is the heart of this acculturation accommodation. I definitely want to click on that before it goes away. Acculturation accommodation um, question. So uh, other 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 thoughts, uh, anybody like Matityahu here in this story? Anybody think he comes across well? No, nobody, nobody's in love with the with the approach that Matityahu, it's very similar to Pinchas. I mean, it's very similar to what we find in the Torah in which Pinchas stabs, you know, stabs a dude uh, who's participating in illicit, idolatrous relations. All right, so let's, what I wanted well, to do hmm. is, yeah, Ben. I'll just say one thing. I mean, uh, I, I don't th I don't know that you see a lot of parallels here with what we think of as um, assimilation in the United States. Um, but I think you do see a lot of parallels between um, what's here and what's happening in France um, because they do have this approach that that everybody within the nation should be one people and should essentially abandon their particular customs um, when necessary to, um, you know, when they act uh, in public in essentially civic life, you know, um, so I think there we see a, a pr and, and th that's causing a lot of problems um, when faced with with people like the Maccabees that don't want to give up their customs, right? And want to uh, maintain their um, identity and, you know, are, are well, not I mean, willing does, just to be like everybody complicated. else. I mean, it is complicated in a pandemic to have one group of people operating under one uh, system of laws and another group of people uh, observing a different system of laws and you know to have people maintain their peculiar their particularity in the midst of a nationwide or worldwide pandemic yeah. is not without its conflicts but that's for a different reason 
right? We don't have we don't have a system in the United States which says in order to be an American, you you have to abandon your your own customs uh, or even at least in certain contexts, right? This is an emergency, right? It's not part of our national character. It is part of the French national character. Um, that that being a, a, a Frenchman is is uh, in many ways incompatible with any kind of religious or sectarian identities and that when you behave in the public square you have to behave as a as a Frenchman period right um, so I, I think that's that's in pretty stark contrast to the way we think of American identity which is, you know, that we, we are pluralistic as, as a, or at least, you know, uh, we're founded that, that way. And I think, you know, many of us value that, especially as American Jews. And there are those in America who want to attack that and say, well, we should just be a white Christian nation. Um, but that's sort of, I would say, mostly at odds with our history rather than being sort of a, a clear continuation. Well, so here's here's what's in the news now, and I don't. I mean, there are a million reasons why this doesn't apply. But does halacha require vaccination against dangerous diseases such as measles, rubella, polio, and COVID nineteen? Uh, and so Stuart Ain, who's not here, is currently working on this story. What is Rabbi's responses to sort of a worldwide pandemic? And you know, uh, fundamentalist Jewish communities historically have not been great when it comes to um, vaccinations in general. Uh, and uh, we are in a moment of uh, sort of acute uh, concern. So I think um, I, I think the questions are worth asking. I, I understand. I really hope Ben. I think you, your statement is so optimistic in thinking that this is a one-year deal. Uh, we I, haven't I really, had, I, I really hope, I really hope that that's the case. We haven't had a violent response in this country around these issues. They have had violent responses in France. They've had Maccabees there, basically, right? Muslims who are saying no, we 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 reject. Um, the ways that we're being asked to accommodate, and we are going to respond violently to what we see as as overreach by the state into our religious life, right? So that's a that hasn't happened here, right? But it has happened there, thankfully. Um, so here we have. Some, uh, so we're going to go to Germany now. Okay, this Hirsch in Germany, 19th century. Um, Hanukkah represents the clash of two doctrines, two views and two civilizations capable of molding opinions, training and educating those who until this very day compete for mastery of the world, Hellenism and Judaism. These are the two forces whose effect upon the nations mark the historical development of humankind and which surfaced in Judea for the first time in the days of Mattathias. Hellenism and Judaism, when examined in depth, they are the two leading forces that today again are struggling for mastery in the Jewish world. Uh, and so Hirsch breaks down these two world views. Uh, so what is Hellenism? Hellenism is the search for self ennoblement. It is motivated solely by a delight in one's own personality, by satisfaction with its improvement, and by the pleasure derived from the awareness of a nobler existence. It says here, Hellenist, this is his take, this is Hirsch's take, we just we don't have to agree with it. Hellenistic culture was unable to fashion a proper lifestyle for the individual, for families, or for communal existence. And so he compares Hellenism and uh, sort of the Jewish approach to two of the sons of uh, Noah, Shem, and Yafet, and he says Yafet represents Hellenism. Shem, Hashem represents that spirit, proclaims the name of only one in the world, really the idea that there is a God, All right? So we have these two divisions. And what I wanted to pull up here, there's a lot here, and I'm not going to be able to get into to all of it, but he does talk a little bit about where, what are the stories uh, of the past, 
All right. So he says the teaching. Okay, hold on. Here's the story of Hanukkah right here. On the eve of the 25th of Kislev, you kindled the Hanukkah lights in your home and for eight days with the greeting of the ever increasing light, the memory of an old story of ancient times crosses the threshold of your mind. Is this a story of the past, right? So he quotes one example from first Maccabees. In those days, rebels against the law came forward and tried to persuade the people thus, let us go and make a covenant with the people around us. For since we have separated ourselves from them, many misfortunes have befallen us. The, section we just read from. So, and then there's Jason, the brother of Onius, succeeding to the office of the high priest arose and went to the king and promised him 360 talents of silver and in addition, 80 talents from other revenues over and above this, he promised him another 150 talents. Um, I guess it's like a Jeff Bezos type of character. If he, I'm kidding. Uh, if he should be authorized to exercise supreme power, and erect a college with an institution for physical exercises. When the king conceded this and Jason had received this authority, he immediately set about to lead his countrymen astray, persuading them to adopt Hellenistic customs. He abolished uh, those very commendable practice which the former king had instituted for the Jews. He discarded the customs that were in accordance with the law and he substituted for them useful, unlawful usages through this scandalous and criminal behavior of the godless and by no means high priestly Jason, the movement towards Hellenism and the impulse to adopt foreign practices became so strong that even the priests no longer concerned themselves with the service of the altar. Instead, they became contemptuous of the temple, neglecting the sacrifices and ran out to participate in other online gatherings at the proclamation announcing the throwing of the discus. Their ancestral dignities, they slighted and Hellenic applause seemed to them the highest attainment. Okay, so this is Jason. This, this is the, the high priest, buys himself into power and leads the Jews astray. Uh, and the argument that Hirsch is going to make here, we're not gonna be able to get all of it, but he does want to note here for you must note that this revolt of which the voices of the past have just given an account was not provoked from without. It was not the consequence of Antiochus wild attack on Judaism. This revolt of the Jewish teachers of God's law and of the upper classes of society in Judea was voluntary. It preceded the frenzy of the king. It was strictly speaking, the actual cause, the real origin of the subsequent fanatical anti Jewish outbreak. It was not Judas Maccabeus who defeated Antiochus of Syria. It was the Jewish light that gained the victory over the dazzling luster of Hellenic splendor, the spirit that Matityahu had harbored in his priestly breast and had nurtured in his children was the rock upon which the Hellenic evil was smashed. The spirit, not the warrior's sword, nor the priest's tiara interwoven, with the crown of princely might, maintain the law among the people. And of course, he says, do not all the signs of our times indicate that we are in the need of a new genuine Hanukkah. Do we not see the dangers from the days of Antiochus once again threatening the temples and the homes of Israel? Do we not see state edicts preventing us from holding services or reading from our Torah, preventing us from entering the building with other people? telling us when and can't, when we can and can't worship. Um, and are we, what are we going to stand up for? And so that is really the spirit of Matityahu and of Judah Maccabee. So um, interesting holiday, interesting holiday to um, be a source of such, um, you know, esteem uh, from our um, members writ large and also an underexplored portion of the holiday. So, um, well, I mean, do we do we have the same critical eye on Jason and the accommodators that go along to get along as Hirsch has? Do we see Matityahu as an unpalatable example of extremism? Um, I mean, what I, we, we've spent months here in this group talking about politics. 
talking about when Jews should and shouldn't disrupt politicians. Uh, when it is upon the Jews to poke their finger in the eye of the ruler and when it's not a great idea for us to do that. So, I mean, what do you think? Do you see any similarities to our world here or my, or my attempts to provoke too far-fetched? Ben. I got a different read here. Do it, please. Well, at least in terms of what Hirsch is saying. Uh, he's saying it's a civil war, right? He's saying this is not about Jews standing up against state power. This is about Jews standing up against other Jews. This is about, this um, is exactly it, reformism, reform Hellenism against the Orthodox, I mean, I hate to, traditional Jewry, that's right. Right, and I think that is very relevant. And um, I mean, not just denominationally, but what, you know, what uh, are we, do we stand up for and what do we, uh, how do we operate and what kind of culture do we want to uh, maintain, right? Are we about self-actualization, right? Is that our highest good? Okay. Um, or are we about um, something else, right? Are we about the um, righteousness in service of, of, of the community? The greater goal, that's right. Um, Do you have and, an opinion? And, yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the Hellenistic um, uh, system, value system, has reached the end of the road. Uh, um, and it has led to a, a sick culture in, in this country, I believe. Um, and I think there is a role there for, for Jews and, and you know, uh, uh, all um, religious organizations that have different kinds of cultural frameworks um, to be able to, um, uh, you know, demonstrate other kinds of values that can help heal that. Which are sorely, which are sorely needed in this day and age. I think the, the values established in the 21st century don't seem to be cutting it for the 21st century. Um, thank you, Ben. Uh, I really, um, really powerful moving thoughts. Bert. Well, I, I mean, I sort of agree with Ben, but I also think that Hirsch completely misrepresents Hellenism. <laughs> I mean, I would say in the modern context, Hellenism is science as opposed to religion. And I think the two, I mean, where I would go against maybe the Maccabees, and maybe we could get into the historical facts. I mean, let's face it, the inn was Rome conquered all of them. So it's not like they really triumphed. And of course, one of the reasons that they're not in the Tanakh is always because they're very controversial as to they handled the priesthood and they became the, the husband and family became some of the worst dictators and they ended up murdering each other uh, anyway. But I- I, and do, I, I would, would never have guessed that from this route. Sorry, that's too cynical, snarky. Yeah, keep going. Well, I mean, I think the essence to me and, and it, it, it has its reflection today, you have to compromise. Nobody is going to get what they want. But you couldn't, you can't compromise with anti Well, you Japanese. don't know that, nobody tried. I mean, if, if you read the story literally, nobody ever said, look, Antiochus, you know, we understand that we're, we're your subjects. I mean, I hate to quote Jesus, but, you know, give unto, give unto Antiochus what is Antiochus is and give unto God what is God. We don't, I mean, again, this is gross, spec, gross speculation, but Antiochus is presented, I mean, what is, you know, I think Epiphanes means devout. Or, or, I mean, I think Antiochus Epiphanes- He took that name, yeah, he took that the name The Greek world- That was wasn't his, yeah. Was, so, I mean, we don't know. I mean, take, take, it, take it to practical, to practical everyday American politics. Should you at least first start with trying to reach an agreement? And then, you know, I mean, there's so many historical parallels all around. You could say that uh, agreements were, were I always do throw Hitler, you know, you're, you're losing, but you know, oh, yes, yes. you can't do it. That's Godwin's law. Right. And they fail. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that war or all, all out rebellion is necessarily always bad, but I do think you have to try and compromise first. And uh, anyway, that, you know, I mean, it goes on to, to, to the, to the later struggles with Rome when the zealots took over and it ended up in the whole destruction of the people. So there, there's so many aspects of this, but I, but I do think, in the modern world, go back to the point I tried to make originally is Hellenism is science 
and Maccabees is maybe religion, and and the two have to work together, or neither one is going to succeed. Right? That that's right. That's right. And I guess my argument is you see unbelievable hubris on both sides mm -hmm. of that argument, ability to state claims far beyond anything that any human being would be able to state. Um, so let's continue the second part of the story here, and let's go to. Judah Maccabee, his son. Hold on. Let me see. Hanukkah texts right here. All right. Now, again, this is just some assorted verses from the second book of Maccabees. So I think this is written as a letter. Um, so in the reign of Demetrius in the year 169, the year we Jews wrote to you in the critical distress, which came upon us in those years after Jason and his company revolted from the Holy Land and the kingdom and burned the gate and shed innocent blood. We besought the king and we were heard and we offered sacrifices and cereal offerings and we lit the lamps and we set out the loaves. Now see that you keep the Feast of Booths in the month of Kislev in the 188th year. Now Maccabees and his followers the Lord leading them on recovered the temple and the city and they tore down the altars which had been built in the public square by the foreigners. They purified the sanctuary, then striking fire out of the flint, they offered sacrifices after a lapse of two years. I think this is the first year I ever really appreciated that. Imagine not being able to go into a temple for two years. I mean, we can. I, th I mean, we really can for the first time. I mean, so like, imagine you've been out of the temple for two years. You now can imagine that a little bit. After a lapse of two years, they burned incense. By the way, I think we should do a smudge stick or something when we're able to come back here and light some lamps and have a festival. I think it's a grand idea. We probably will do something like that if we're able to, God willing. When they had done this, they fell prostrate and besought the Lord that they might never again fall into such misfortunes, but that if they should ever sin, they might be disciplined by him with forbearance and not be handed over to blasphemous and barbarous nations. It happened that on the same day when the sanctuary was profaned by the foreigners, the purification took place. So that's the 25th day of Kislev. So therefore, do Sukkis again, pretty much as it says here. So they celebrated for eight days with rejoicing, just like Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. Remembering not before the long, they had been literally in the wilderness like wild animals celebrating Sukkis. So therefore... Um, they decided to do a Sukkot Sheni uh, and begin it on the 25th of Kislev, and they decreed by public ordinance and vote that the whole nation of Jews should observe this every year. And again, as Gary Sokol noted, there's nothing in there about the oil. Um, thoughts? I mean, I think it's nice that we won. I think it's great that we got the temple back. We got all that gunk. We got all that gunk out of the sanctuary, we, we smudge sticked it, we, uh, we lit up some new candles and we beautified it. Um, I have, I mean, I have got a lot more sources here. I've got a source from Rabbi Lamb from 60 years ago who talks about the distinction between building and rebuilding, dedication and rededication. And why Hanukkah is so significant is because in modern world and modern culture, He's like, he said, King Solomon's temple. I mean, not too hard to get someone to want to build King Solomon's temple because here, here, because it's new. People like doing new projects, right? People really like working on brand new projects, building projects from the top. And so thus when King Solomon took it upon himself to build a new Beit HaMikdash, it was a comparatively easy enterprise. He was able to ride on the crest of popular peer mass sentiment. Who doesn't want to build something new? But when many hundreds of years later, the Maccabees returned to a des desecrated temple, to a sanctuary that had been profaned in the eyes of people, how about a sanctuary, a movement, a branch of Judaism, left for dead, easier to start a new one, but not these Maccabees. These Maccabees understood the beauty in rebuilding something and recapturing the beauty of what once was. And that's uniquely Jewish. So Rabbi Lamb writes, but when many hundreds of years later, the Maccabees returned 
to a sanctuary to restore its old eminence, a Beit HaMikdash, which was already an old story to the citizenry of Jerusalem, when they had to reconsecrate what had been defiled, that was a great achievement, for they could not count upon mass movements and popular sentiment. Their project required enormous vision, tremendous courage, vast inner resources, and an iron conviction. Hence, the reward of the Maccabees is greater than that of King Solomon. Their task was more heroic because of the very prosaic nature which inheres in every task of rebuilding as opposed to the romantic, attractive enterprise of building for the first time. So I just adore that homily. I don't know if other people uh, do as well, but I resonate with that for all of the reasons that I came to Beth Shalom in the first place. Um, I, and for some of the reasons I'm a conservative rabbi, um, I've gone off to try to do the new thing. And I just having been at this show for two and a half years feel much more, and he goes in, I'm, I can read more of that beautiful sermon. Maybe I will tomorrow morning if you want to join me for that. But he goes into beautiful explication there of just the untold power, love, grace that one can feel in recapturing and replacing the menorah back in its place and lighting it up again that the creation of something new on its own can ever amount to. And I, so I was going to say, I, you know, I've experienced that here. There's just a sense of having Beth Shalom be vibrant again over Hanukkah with people coming that is that feels different than having to create, than creating something new, cool, and hip. So I, that's why this resonates with me. Marv. Wasn't the uh, building of the temple actually a concession by God because sure. we weren't So was the kingship. To, so was the kingship. I mean, I mean, we're supposed to build a temple in ourselves, but, but our ability to do that, of course, is... Uh, perhaps overwhelming. Uh, and flawed, so, yeah. And, and so in order to capture the mind and perhaps over time, allow ourselves to understand how to build a temple in our body, we, we uh, in our in, in, in secular natures, we had to be patterned first in a way to, to have a structure, a temple that would allow us to maintain our identity in order to- We needed to something hold, external to help us. We know, needed something external to assist us. And you know, Marv, I just, I always overshare in this class, but whatever. Uh, it's not like it's being recorded. Uh, I got into a, just a discussion this week with somebody about the nature of this lockdown and his very strong upset and anger over the current administration in this country and the handling of COVID and, um, uh, and just like insisting that we just have to lock everything down and all of that sort of stuff. And I was saying, well, human nature doesn't really lend itself to being locked down very well. Uh, and I think we have to take into consideration human nature when considering sort of how we operate in a society. We might want everyone to stay in their house, but people will lie and people will not follow the rules and the thing will still spread. And figuring out a response that takes human nature into consideration is important. I think Marv, that's a little bit what you're getting at there. Yeah. Marv, no, of course. Oh yeah, no, when Marv finished, finished, yeah. In, in contemporary times, I mean, we're talking about the Orthodox in New York wanting to carry on their religious uh, rituals in the face of a society that's trying to impose uh, perhaps some scientific uh, knowledge and trying to uh, uh, maintain a healthy society. And uh, acting think, in loco, acting in loco parentis, I believe, is the Latin well, expression. Well, of course, you could say that perhaps the Orthodox community uh, does have to understand that there is a a, a reason for this, and uh, perhaps the Orthodox community 
is a bit ignorant. Well, I don't want to paint. I don't want to paint uh, a big picture of the Orthodox community because I don't think but, we're painting well, them in the right. Any, I don't think the well, Orthodox writ large. I think Orthodoxy is saying to follow the laws. And don't be crazy and pikuach nefesh comes first. I think we're talking about a fundamentalist brand. I don't want to paint such a large picture with orthodoxy. I, I just use fundamentalism as opposed well, to orthodoxy. I think perhaps some of the fundamentalists in our society are clearly um, uh, ignorant of, of what uh, we have knowledge of today and uh, uh, don't understand that in order to protect life, after all, life is the ultimate value that we want to protect. Uh, that has to be weighed against their uh, religious oh, obligation. Can I argue with you just for a second, just to play, just have a little fun here for a moment. What's life? Is life cooped up inside a 500 square foot apartment for years on end? Is that life? Yeah, but that's not realistic. We're not talking about years on the end. It's been a we, year. We well, that that's a year. That's not years, and we have an end point. Hopefully, that we're coming to, and uh, and clearly, there's a lot of of life lost. It's not just your own life that you're putting at risk. You're extending your uh, perhaps your ignorance to uh, uh are we other... overstating our human and scientific ability to uh, countermeasure to countermeasure nature in a way that is uh overstated uh yes yeah, I, I think I, oh here's I, gary gary hates when i do this gary just but... loathes when i take this uh school well, i have to say in support of mark that um you know, if it was all about individual agency, you'd be right. But the people who, if you're the Haredim and they go to stores and if they go to the bodega in their neighborhood to get things, they go to the hospital, they go to various shops and they, they because of their um, unwillingness to follow the rules that are set down, Put they, other people at risk. It's like second, it's like going in and smoking cigarette in someone's face, exactly. And, and that is actually, if, if you want to know the way the laws against smoking came about is not because it harmed people, but because secondhand smoke harmed people. Um, and it was the workers who were protected. You can't smoke in a bar because the bartenders will inhale the smoke. And that's the thing that these people are. not You have agency to make decisions that affect you, but not when it affects the rest of the society and you don't give them a choice. Essential workers in supermarkets and everywhere else do not have the choice to work. They've got to eat and they've got to pay rent. Other thoughts? Anybody else? We, uh, we've heard a bunch from Bert and Gary and Ben. What about other people here on this call? Do anybody else want to chime in a little bit? Don't worry, I'll get cover for you. Remember, all opinions are welcome. Only politeness is required. I'll cover you if you want to say something politically incorrect. It's welcomed here. Anybody else want to chime in? Stephanie, this is the second time in uh, 24 hours you've gone through this story here. Um, what, what do you have any anything you want to share? Not to put you on the spot, but anything you want to share? One second, I had to unplug my headphones because I'm in a conference room. <laughs> okay. Somebody in. Um, are you referring now to the curing discussion about the- like, Well, I just to the, the story of Matityahu and Judah Maccabee and just this, uh, do we stand up for what we believe in or do we find some sort of accommodation with science? Yeah, I did actually have one question that came to mind that I wanted to ask. So yesterday we, we had covered that the story of the oil is nowhere in the original story, right? And it comes from the Talmud. So That's right. I, I wanted to know, what about the Hanukkiah? Is it already, what, what is the first reference to it? Because I mean, in, in, in the story that's then in the Talmud, they say that it's in front of the temple. Okay, right? good, good question. So the menorah, um, menorah comes from the root of or, it just means candelabra. There was a candelabra, which was a seven, what do they call those? Seven sticks, seven, 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 one, two, three, and then one in the middle. I don't know what that's called. Um, branches. 
branches. branches. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you. That should be obvious. Seven branch uh, candelabra. And that was the candelabra that was used in the temple and was always lit up. All right. So you had this candelabra and um, that candelabra was a sign of presence, life, just like we have a Nair Tamid in our sanctuary, uh, eternal light that's always a flame. And that when they returned, they very quite naturally wanted to light that menorah, that candelabra, and they lit it and it was supposed to last for one day, but it lasted of course for eight days. And so for Hanukkah, we have a separate candelabra, which is improperly referred to, well, it's a menorah, all menorahs give out oh, give out light, but not all menorahs are nine branched, I guess is the way to put it. So a menorah can have nine branches, a menorah can have seven branches, but a Chanukiah only has nine branches. It's not a Chanukiah. If it has less than nine branches, it's called a Chanukiah because it's used on Hanukkah and it has one branch for each day and the helper branch called the Shamas. So that was, it was it's an invention, it's an extension of the menorah to accommodate the holiday itself. Okay, so but the menorah was already... Uh, yes, the menorah is a classic, that is a classic Jewish symbol, a classic Jewish um, uh, artifact that was in the temple. Uh, Sandy Edwards. Well, I also heard that the reason there is a shamash is that you're not supposed to use the candles for any purpose when you light them. So you need the shamash in order to light the other candles. That's right. You're not supposed to, it should serve no practical purpose whatsoever. You shouldn't use it for light. You shouldn't use it for cooking. It should just um, be, be lit for its own sake. Um, other, other, I have hands here. If are those old hands or those new hands, Marv and Gary uh, and uh, yeah, Gary, go right ahead. So I'm sorry, I had to step away, but um, I have a problem. There's a duality with Hanukkah. I mean, the Hanukkah is told by the Maccabees is fundamentalism, ultranationalism, power makes right. Yep. That's something to celebrate the victory of that. And that leaves me very uncomfortable. Now, the miracle, as the rabbis reinterpreted it, and really beautifully, as Marilyn discussed last night, is the idea of bringing light onto the world and a reinterpretation of what happened, the miracle of Hanukkah, and the idea that, you know, with power comes responsibility, and the, the ability to shine a light in the darkness is where the true power and meaning in the world comes. That's a pretty powerful reinterpretation of the story. Uh, so, and, and it's a lovely, and it's the lovely one. And so it's one you, that has very little to do with the story itself. Right. But I mean, when you were saying like, oh, isn't this wonderful, the whole, the, the Maccabees. Well, I don't mind the, I don't, I mean, I don't mind some of Matsit Yahu's behavior. I mean, I'm, I'm saying the rabbinic one is much more powerful to me and I'm really uncomfortable with the other one because there's uh, not, there's nothing I can, I mean, in the world as I live in today, it has, you know, it actually, the the Maccabean story is one that would embrace the one by the um, the, Hasid, the Haredim. And what they're doing is our might makes us right and we're not going to compromise and all of that. And that's not a, a, that's not a view. And that's a logical take from the story of Hanukkah. Well, as the rabbinic one with this candle and, and using our power to bring light onto the world is pretty powerful. So what does that teach you? What does that teach you about rabbinism, about the rabbinic Judaism? I mean, that teaches us a great lesson about our faith here. Right. But it also, the interesting thing is if I take it and abstract it, it talks about the power of what we're doing as modern progressive Jews is taking these, um, you know, taking these rituals like it was described, uh, mehedrin la mehedrin. It's hard to believe that as secular Jews, we are behaving, you know, many secular Jews are behaving more religiously, more frumkite than what is required by the rabbis. And it says we have the right to claim this part of Jewish history 
for ourselves and make the rituals that give meaning to us as we live. I, in a, amen. And that should be the goal and the purpose of our community. Bert. Well, let's not forget it was not the Maccabees who rebuilt the temple. It was Herod. And Herod was a master of compromising Roman because they really had replaced the Greeks as the major power. And that's... Uh, yeah. Uh, and I mean, to me, you know, we're skipping so much between the current and the past and all. But Herod was not a nice person. Uh, you know, as Emperor Augustus said, he might rather be his pig than his son uh, because he wouldn't kill pigs, but he I, killed I, I, So but, I guess, so I guess. He was, I'm sorry. He, he it put in, in, into contemporary times the example of Herod of having to draw a very fine line between Jewish practices and government practices. And I can imagine what Herod would have done uh, if there was an outbreak. I mean, if you think what's being done now, locking up, Herod would have locked up the person <laughs> that he built. Uh, who was that king? The, who was that king who locked himself in his room until the plague ended? Wasn't there a king who locked himself in his own room? Yeah. That his was food right. brought to him until this play, until the plague. Yeah. I forget who that was. Again, I'm no historian, but I mean, that's a good idea, right? It's good to be the king. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I come back to compromise is the only answer. Uh, this was the line that I quoted last night in the class that Stephanie attended. I quoted, I've already quoted to Braveheart here once, so I'll quote it again in which Robert the Bruce's father says to him about William Wallace, he says, uh, uncompromising men are easy to admire. Uh, and I remember, and I remember that from the movie, but then I was also told that uh, Mel Gibson um, had been banned uh, and I was not allowed to make reference to him. So I, 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 I ran afoul. Uh, there a little bit. But I, I think the point that Gary got at is sort of the essence of who we are as Jews. We are fundamentally uncomfortable um, with the slaughter as, I mean, that might have been too broad a statement, but I think a lot of us are fundamentally uncomfortable with the slaughter as expressed by Matityahu uh, and his family. Uh, and we are suspicious of that rebellious fundamentalist drive um, for good reasons. And so were the rabbis of the Talmud. And, but there was this ritual that was super popular and it was probably annoying to them like it's been annoying to Jews in the previous century. Why does the holiday of Hanukkah persist? And nobody cares about Shavuos. Shavuos is such a better holiday. And on the class yesterday, one of the answers that we got is, well, Hanukkah is a great holiday because all your other Jewish holidays are led in with so much depth and meaning. This is such a nice light holiday. I, I'm, I enjoy the lightness of the holiday itself, which, which I guess is a slap in the face to the rabbis and perhaps a justifiable one. Uh, and I think, um, I, I think that discomfort with that sort of zealotry, with that fundamentalism, with flying in the face of everything. The only other example, I mean, reading through Matityahu, the only other example comparable, anybody know the example I'm thinking of? It's Abraham and the Akedah. I mean, Matityahu sounds like Abraham. I don't care if everybody else in the world thinks I'm crazy. And that to me sounds a lot like Abraham. Um, and that has its appeal and obviously that has its dangers. Uh, and I just think it's good to engage in this because I think understanding what role we wanna play as Jews, how safe we feel in our modern culture and society. And I guess whether or not we're experiencing a one-time sort of lockdown of our ability to walk into our shul and pray, or if this is a harbinger of things to come. Gary, so. so what you said just triggered something in me. You notice on all these other Chagim during the Holomoed, we don't like to fill in. We don't need to be re reminded of mitzvot and God's presence in the world. Hanukkah, it's a time of joy. And if we are commemorating the slaughter, we do wear like to fill in. And it's because we're, we're required when we're, if we're celebrating this kind of thing to remember the mitzvot and, and God's presence in the world. It's an interesting, I never thought of that before, but it's an interesting way to look at it. <laughs> it's right, no, I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Okay, I'm gonna stop, Every, stay right here. I have one quick question to ask, but I wanna just stop the recording here. I thank you for engaging uh, in the class that I, excuse me, that I called, uh, wait, that's the story of Hanukkah. Uh, all right, so let me stop the recording here.